Just to put our scripture today in context, earlier this summer, Simon Critchley had an op-ed piece in the New York Times in which Critchley said, sorry all of you so-called new atheists, uh, Hitchens and Dawkins and, and all, uh, sorry, Americans are not becoming more atheistic. He cited a recent poll, something like 94% of us when asked say, we believe in God. Critchley says what's happening is not that people are forsaking belief in God. What's happening in America is people are forsaking belief in God as presented by Jews and Christians from Scripture. That it isn't that we're disposing of our gods, we're switching gods that we have disposed of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for the God, as Critchley puts it, the God of me. The God who is a projection of my ideal self, my hopes and aspirations. Critchley notes there was a day when people went to church to, to get salvation, to worry about their eternal destiny, to be close to God. Now we go to church to get closer to ourselves that our main project is no longer salvation, our main project is the care and feeding of our own egos. Self-fulfillment has replaced what Christians used to talk about as salvation. Well, if that's true, then today's scripture from Colossians is a very different word. Paul begins his letter to First Church Colossae, not by talking about them, but by talking about God in Jesus Christ. And here's what he says. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He Himself is before all things. In Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He might come to have first place in everything. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My successor at Duke Chapel, Sam Wells, noted that in the 18th and into the 19th centuries, when Christianity was having trouble making its case to the modern world, Christian apologists presented the Christian faith as reasonable. Reason was all the rage and, and Christian apologists said, hey, if you think about it my way, the Christian faith makes a lot of sense. It's reasonable, it's rational. But Wells says that beginning in the 20th century, we have an approach to the Christian faith that was unknown in the entire history of the church. Now the Christian faith is presented by Christian apologists as Christianity is good for you. Christianity is useful. You tell us what you want. Oh. Well, Jesus can deliver that to you. Jesus is a kind of primitive uh, uh, first century kind of technique for getting whatever you want out of life more than you might want Jesus. Uh, and this typifies much of the faith of our age. I remember going to a so-called contemporary worship service a few years ago and the service opened with a song. And the song 
was something like, Here I am to worship. Here I am to praise you. Here I am to be with you. Here I am to think about you. Here I am. Here I am. Look, and <clears throat> notice anything lacking in that hymn? Like, God. Notice the preponderance of the first person personal pronoun singular in that. Yeah. It gives credence to Critchley's critique that, that we've somehow managed to stop looking at the God who has turned to us and we've made our faith into just another means to turn ever deeper into ourselves. Uh, a few years ago I participated in a research project of Methodist and preaching and we ask Methodists, what do you look forward most in a sermon? And as I remember, the predominant response was, I like a sermon in which the preacher uh, uh, points out to me in a nice way where I've gone wrong, uh, some things in my life that could be better, and then gives me encouragement to live my life in a different way. Notice anything missing in that definition of preaching? How far is that? How far is that from this statement in Colossians? Where, where it is said of Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God. The Greek word there is icon. He is the icon by which you see God. For most of human history, God is invisible. God is arcane and aloof until Jesus. And when people looked at Jesus, they said, that is how God really looks. That's how God really acts. He is the image of the invisible God. And then Colossians says, He is the firstborn of creation. In Him all things were created. Uh, whether things on earth or things in heaven, wow, what, what a bodacious, extravagant claim to make of Jesus. Jesus is no longer just like the good friend. Jesus is, is no longer a great teacher or a great moral example. You hear that from time to time. No, before the world was, Colossians says, Jesus was. He created the world. He is the very creator of the world. He isn't just somebody who points us toward God. He is God. It's kind of amazing. These extravagant sweeping claims for Christ. Had you the time, and I doubt you do, Professor Warren Smith could explain to you in church history how through most of church history, well, for the, certainly the earliest parts of church history, the, the debate wasn't, is Jesus really divine? No, the debate was, how can somebody who is that much God also be fully human? In our day, it seems different. It seems almost as, as if we can't take a great big cosmic Jesus that was here before the world was, who is part of the very creation, the fabric of the universe. We got to get God kind of carved down to, to our size. A few years ago, a group of uh, alleged scholars on the West Coast formed something called the Jesus Seminar. And as I recall, their argument was, well, you see, we the historical Jesus was uh, a itinerant rabbi. He was, some said, a kind of spiritual person, a very spiritually attuned person. Others said uh, he was a wonderful teacher of Near Eastern wisdom. And he gathered some disciples around him and then he was crucified and dead. But shortly after he died, this is their theory, these disciples got together and they said, wow, 
Jesus was really a great person and um, wow, he, he just, and kind of the more we get together, you know, I mean, it's almost like he's still with us and, uh, and wow, he was so good. He wasn't just a good teacher. He was just, he was, uh, let's pump him up. He was like God. Well, nice try, Jesus Seminar. Uh, that theory may work for how people act in California, but it doesn't act with the evidence of the New Testament. What I just read you from Colossians, scholars think is probably an early Christian hymn that Paul weaves into his letter. And scholars think Colossians could be some of the oldest writing in the New Testament. We are not reading at a, a, a later inflated estimate of Jesus. We're reading what those who first met Jesus and were closest to him thought about Jesus. They did not say, wow, he is a really interesting teacher. They didn't say, huh, he's uh, got some great moral teaching that we would all be better off if we followed. They said, he's God. He, as Colossians said, in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That's what they said, the first who met him. In him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Get that? I mean, that means that uh, Christians are people who believe that when we look at this Jew from Nazareth who lived briefly and died violently and then rose unexpectedly we've seen as much of God Almighty as we ever hope to see it means that when we look at Jesus we're not looking at, at, at kind of a, a, a replica of God we're not looking at like uh, a, a sort of a really attuned uh, spokesperson for God. God looks like Jesus. I mean, God talks like Jesus. God relates to the world like Jesus. You can't say anything about God after Jesus Christ that you couldn't say about Jesus. Uh, what a bodacious claim kind of amazing when you think about the context. Here's this little fledgling congregation at Colossae hanging on by their fingernails at a forgotten corner of the Roman Empire. You think about Duke Memorial Church. We've got so many challenges. We, we've got so many big assignments facing us. We're in a world that doesn't seem to be that responsive and attuned as it maybe once was to the claims of the gospel. <laughs> well, the church at Colossae had it a lot worse. And they didn't talk about reorganizing their congregation. They talked about God. They made a claim. Their claim was not, wow, early first century world, we have discovered a new technique to, like, to give you a purpose-driven life. No. What they said was, we've learned the secret about God. We now have found out through Jesus Christ who God really is. He is the firstborn of creation. That's just a biblical way of saying He is reality. You scratch the world, you get down to the grain of the universe, and it is what he was, love. I don't know whether you need this message today or not. In a way, I'm not supposed to care. I mean, in one sense. But I'll tell you, the church, I think, makes a big mistake at swimming around down in the shallow end of the pool most of the time. In dealing with people who are reasonably well fixed, reasonably self-centered, reasonably doing okay. But when the chips are down, what is our hope? I got a friend that 
Somebody said the other day, uh, he, he said a man went to his church and a man introduced himself and he said, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God, but I do want my children to get some moral instruction. And the pastor was thinking, gee, I know a lot about the morals of this congregation and I don't know if you've come to the right place, but I, he didn't say that. But he said, I, I, I don't need this, but the kids need it and I've come here and I'm an atheist. Well, he said he got an email from him the other day and he said, I've been listening to your sermons and I can't figure it out. Mostly what I've heard from Christians over the years is some kind of political solution, either of the right or of the left. What we need is better politics. We need more caring politics. Or I've heard sappy, silly, sentimental gibberish about what nice people we are and how we can be good little boys and girls, you don't ever seem to preach about that. Well, if you don't think politics is the hope and you don't think we're the hope, what do you think the hope is? And he wrote back, we think there's no hope if Jesus Christ is not who the Scriptures bodaciously claim him to be. When the chips are down, our hope, our ultimate hope in life and death and life beyond death is that Jesus Christ is indeed the full revelation of what God is up to in the world. Of God's intention for us in the world. Therein is our hope. I got a friend, he was serving a church in uh, Washington State. And he went to this church and he said he was just amazed that the church talked about serving the community and the church talked about uh, having a happier marriage and the church talked about this and that. And, and he said, I, I just felt like, you know, the, the church ought to like talk about Jesus more often. So I had a study group. And uh, the study group was sort of on what we believe about God and all. And so he was talking one night and this, uh, and suddenly this fire-breathing, angry, feminist, maybe that's a tautology, but uh, uh, yelled out, I will never again have any man tell me how I'm supposed to live my life. And my friend kind of gasped, and then she said, unless that man just happens to be the Son of God. You know, this kind of thing ought to be done the way it's done in Colossians. It ought to be done poetically rather than prosaically. This kind of deep truth about who God is, it probably ought to be not said by a preacher, but sung by choir and congregation.